Uh, good day, my name is Brad Prezant. I am the current Vice President of Practice for ISIAC, the International Society of Indoor Air Quality and Climate. With me today is Professor Lydia Murawska, Director of the International Laboratory for Air Quality and Health at Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia. Dr. Murawska and 239 colleagues, many of whom are members of ISIAC's Academy, were recently successful in persuading the WHO to acknowledge the evidence base supporting aerosol transmission of SARS-CoV-2 after publication of hers and Donald Milton's manuscript, It is Time to Address Airborne Transmission of COVID-19. Most ISIAC members are familiar with the argument for aerosol transmission, having heard your, Lydia's, and others' presentations at ISIAC's indoor air conferences over the last 10 years, or having read relevant articles in our journal, Indoor Air. So I'll be asking uh, you a few questions, uh, Professor, assuming some basic familiarity with these issues. Thank you for joining me, Professor Morowska. First, given what we know about aerosol transmission, can you describe what some of the greatest uncertainties are within this framework and where we might see additional supporting evidence in the short term? Uh, it's a great honor to present this to ISIAC. There were a lot of questions regarding infection transmission before this pandemic, questions to not many people paid uh, much attention as in general uh, in infection transmission, whether airborne or as such within the community wasn't something discussed at, at, at any great deal. This situation now generated lots of questions, many, many questions. Uh, most of them are reasonably, um, well, I wouldn't like to say uh, small questions or undermine them, but questions adding to building the whole jigsaw puzzle in terms of infection spread of the specific virus. But if I were uh, to um, uh, describe what are the biggest questions being asked, I again wouldn't like to use the word uncertainties, there are, is airborne transmission occurring? And on population scale, what's the contribution of airborne transmission to the total infection spread? So I'll first address the one, uh, the first one, is airborne transmission occurring? Well, there's an overwhelming body uh, of evidence demonstrating from different scientific uh, angles that airborne transmission uh, occurs. This is a body of evidence generated not just now during the pandemic, but which has been generated uh, over many years from the angles of uh, aerosol science, which uh, I represent when we are talking about aerosol exhaled uh, from human exploratory activities, the size distribution, the dynamics of this aerosol in the air, from the virology, what such aerosol contains, uh, from uh, epidemiology as well, uh, as I said, it's not specifically, of course, to this virus in relation to the studies uh, that have been done before, but human exploration, for example, and the process of aerosolation during human exploratory activities is the same, whether we are infected with um, uh, COVID-19 or whether we are infected with uh, influenza. So uh, another body of evidence which was generated uh, now, but also similarly during or after SARS-1, uh, retrospective analysis of the transmission uh, during different outbreaks. So the outbreaks in Amway Gardens, the outbreak in the Prince of Wales Hospital, the outbreak on a plane and so on. So as I said, there's an overwhelming evidence that airborne transmission is happening. So however, called for a perfect study which would um, a absolutely proof without any doubt that this specific virus infected this specific group of people. Well, I'm saying, uh, is, uh, is it likely that a perfect study like this would ever be conducted? Well, such study would involve um, uh, prospectively infecting healthy people under controlled conditions with the virus, with this virus. Is there any um, organization responsible for ethical clearance uh, for um, epidemiological studies uh, uh, would uh, approve such study. No, such study will not be conducted. So the 
if the, us, if the question is about this perfect study, it won't be done. But otherwise, uh, the uh, um, evidence is absolutely overwhelming about airborne transmission. So this is not an uncertainty. Now, the question on to what extent uh, the um, airborne transmission uh, contributes on population bears. So whether we are asking whether airborne transmission contributes to 10, 20, 30, 80 uh, percent, this is something which uh, on population base we'll never be able to answer because we'll never be able to properly account infections occurring due to different transmission modes. Well, firstly, because several transmission modes can operate at the same time and will never be enough data properly co uh, uh, collected to, inc to include uh, or exclude different transmission modes occurring in different situations. It is only outbreaks where we can trace things what happen or specific contacts uh, in specific situations. But we cannot tell this on population base and in particular with the number of people, fraction of people who are asymptotic, who are infected, but who don't uh, show any symptoms, they don't know they're infected, we don't know they're infected. So therefore the answer to that question on population base, how much it contributes, will never be available. However, and in environments, specific environments where outbreaks uh, occurred, and where they were modeled, for example, in the, um, uh, during the Mount Vernon uh, choir practice uh, in Washington state, uh, where we were able to do retrospective modeling of what happened based on the data available uh, about this venue, about the activities, about the uh, precautions taken by the uh, members of the choir, where we are clearly pointed out that uh, the only well, basically logical explanation is that this was uh, airborne transmission. Our modeling uh, quite closely agrees what actually happened. So again, the answer to this question is that this is not an uncertainty as such. It's something which we'll never know, but the fact that we don't have specific value, whether it's, as I said, 30, 40, 60 percent on population base, doesn't mean that the evidence which we have is uh, inadequate or that there's an uncertainty. Now, uh, where I see, however, the biggest area where, where it needs to be done, and again, I wouldn't call it uh, an uncertainty, is how to link science of infection spread, in particular infection risk assessment, with building engineering to develop guidelines for infection um, uh, control in various settings. Well, someone uh, may ask, why do we need such uh, guidelines? We have, of course, guidelines uh, for uh, ventilation. Um, uh, for example, we've got in general guidelines for various uh, aspects of engineering measures. Um, but none of this is looking uh, specifically from the angle of infection control. None of this is considering the virus. Um, there have been uh, updates and very good uh, modifications and recommendations uh, done by ASHRAE, by RIVA. But again, this is basically what we, what we, what we know, how um, a improvement in ventilation would uh, improve certain aspects uh, related to um, uh, the control of virus. But the uh, type of guidelines required for uh, done, for example, of being in place in relation to the removal of carbon dioxide, which we um, exhale, is it relevant to uh, control of the virus? Well, uh, not quite. We know exactly how much carbon dioxide we uh, exhaled, but the question about how much uh, how much virus is shed by infected person people and in what situation this is. Um, this is a bigger question, question which can be quanti addressed in a quantitative way, but it, that's what should be done. Now, in, uh, an example which I give in relation to carbon dioxide. Uh, it's not that important in an environment from which carbon dioxide needs to be uh, uh, removed, which way the gas goes, let's say, from a person who uh, exhales it uh, to uh, other people. But in relation to virus or infection control, this is very important. 
which way uh, is going from the, uh, from the infected person. So there are many aspects of this um, uh, link which needs to be provided between the risk assessment, quantitative risk assessment, to this virus, to any virus, and to infection, uh, to, uh, to building engineering measures. And this needs to be done in, um, in such that the system can operate in a flexible manner. For example, we are saying that uh, recirculation is something to avoid during a pandemic, if that recirculation may, uh, would not guarantee that the virus is removed. But recirculation is important uh, in terms of energy conservation. So we don't want to give up energy conservation, so, but we should be able to switch from one system to another. Now, I'm per per perhaps explaining this in a way, in a lay language. I'm not a, a building engineer. I'm, as you know, I'm a, uh, I'm a scientist, but um, this is something which from a big picture we need to be done and these are the questions being asked. So this is the new knowledge which we need to generate, but not necessarily the uncertainty. So this is my answer to your first question. Uh, you, you've answered my second question to a certain extent. My second question was how do you see the recognition of aerosol transmission impacting public policy as well as impacting a particular building owner? Well, this is a slightly different aspect. Um, so far, there's been lots of uh, discussions, speculations, and hypotheses whether airborne transmission is important and if it is, what to do. Um, and this uh, questions asked by individual, questions asked by different organizations, different bodies, but there's been no basically guidance from anywhere what to do. And some were saying, well, it's important we should do something. But of course, uh, if an action is necessary and this action has to be driven by a, um, a government body, state, national, or whatever, well, such bodies are not necessarily eager to jump in doing something which they are not uh, mandated, not requested to do. So it's been kind of uh, talked about, but not much was happening. Recognition of its significance, of the significance of airborne transmission by WHO, activates a whole chain of actions then that, that follows. So this is the most significant aspect of this, that uh, entire single act. The starts chain of activities. So national bodies, or state bodies, which are responsible for um, uh, control uh, of um, uh, um, uh, control of uh, uh, various aspects of public health, then have a process of developing their own guidelines and standards for the specific for the whole country, for the region, and so on. And they have um, very uh, good uh, uh, mechanisms uh, for for doing this. Uh, that's, that's nothing new, the gu guidelines are developed, standards are developed, and uh, the, re the relevant bodies know how to do this. So then once such uh, documents are in place, then once promulgated, down the list, then they will have to be implemented by those who design buildings, operate the buildings, and in general who are responsible for public health. So then there are no questions really asked, but there is a list of things which, are, which need to be done and the way normally such process proceeds. So what I'm stressing is that the recognition by the WHO of the, significance, of the existence of uh, or occurrence of uh, airborne transmission is the single most important step to activate this chain of, uh, of actions. So that's, this is response to my second question. So let me ask you something of a non-technical nature. Is the mechanism of a large group of scientists writing an open letter something that you think could be applied in other contexts or could be directed towards other governmental or non-governmental institutions or even possibly private companies in your opinion? Well, for scientists, writing an open letter is an act of desperation. 
Normally, scientists express the outcomes of uh, our science, of our scientific findings in different ways, ways and in particular in peer-reviewed publications. That's, that's the platform where we say what we've done and to a platform pro for providing new science. Now then the organizations um, in charge of various aspects of operation of civil societies take this into account to develop guidance and standards uh, for, for the operation of different elements of the society. Normally governments and other organizations have mechanisms in place how to be informed uh, and act on emerging science. So they would have their own units uh, which uh, uh, acquire information about uh, um, new science. They would formulate ad hoc bodies to review the information or have standing bodies for, for such. Uh, and then based on the recommendation from these bodies, then they decide what, what to do. So this is a normal process how, how science is uh, um, uptaken by the government and acted by, uh, by, by the government. Now, the problem, however, is if the relevant bodies ignore or dismiss the science. And this has been happening so far in relation to infection transmission in general, but specifically about airborne transmission in public settings. Of course, this, there's a different situation in, in healthcare and in particular in, in the units where um, infectious diseases units. So that's a very different situation. But I'm talking about public settings. So we are talking about the offices, schools, libraries, uh, shopping centers, and so on. That's, that's where the issue of infection transmi transmission has been completely uh, ignored. Well, there are numerous examples uh, through the history of humanity and science that was rejected. We all learned at school that the Copernicus theory of a um, heliocentric uh, universe was not immediately accepted. Far from it. We know what happened to Galileo Galilei. It was later. He was prosecuted and had to renounce the uh, extension of uh, or building up on the Copernicus theory. So this is um, one of the examples where science was completely uh, uh, not only ignored, rejected and prosecuted. Uh, I think that I don't think that at those time uh, in the Middle Ages, scientists, uh, other scientists wrote open letters. If anything, that said, they said quiet not to be prosecuted. Um, in modern history, we know very well that uh, the um, evidence of climate change was or still has been dismissed, despite the overwhelming body of, of, of evidence uh, of the reasons for climate change. And again, we can talk for a long time about what are the reasons for uh, ignoring or rejecting the science. There are many different agendas apart from just dismissing it due to, due to um, non, non lack of belief in this. So the same situation is in relation to the airborne transmission. And this is not only uh, in relation to COVID-19, but to uh, respiratory infection transmission by, uh, by airborne route in general. And the po point is that this affects all of us uh, all the time around the globe. So it's not, it's not a minor issue. And as I said, it's not something which is just related to this uh, specific uh, pandemics. So there was uh, no uh, pub uh, public, so if we go back to this um, Middle Ages situation, there was no public health risk due to um, believing that the sun circles around the earth and not the other way around. But there are huge risks and implications from not accepting climate change and or airborne infection transmission. Because of this, uh, because of these concerns and because of the overwhelming body of evidence that of the significance of such risks, the scientists felt in the case of infection transmission that there was no other avenue for voicing our, vo uh, our views but in an open letter. Well, the open letter was published in a very reputable scientific journal, but I'd say it is still possible that it would have just added to a body of, um, of journal publications uh, and nothing much could have happened. 
There are several other factors which uh, helped in this situation to uh, make our voices, our message heard. So the um, factors which immensely helped was the, um, that the message was um, the help from the media and the uh, media contribution to uh, spreading the message. Um, all of us, or many of us from this group of scientists who signed or wrote the petition, the open letter, uh, were uh, interviewed by, on many occasions by journalists and we were, were in touch with, uh, with the journalists who interviewed us. So uh, once we were informed that the uh, letter was accepted by the journal, we went back to the uh, journalists and uh, we made them prepare that this is going to happen, the, the journal is going to announce this open letter, so be ready for this. And indeed, they had messages prepared to uh, place, to appear in the journals as soon as the um, uh, open letter was released. So this is this chorus of the media around the world that amplified our message from the journal uh, and this was ultimately uh, what made our message heard and considered. So that's what I'm saying. It's not just that we um, prepared and published an open letter, but this whole uh, set of conditions. This, is, this was my first experience uh, for leading a large group of scientists in, in a petition in an open letter and maybe the last, even so uh, everybody around laughs when I say something like this. Uh, but uh, I would say that uh, in planning um, uh, and um, in planning voicing scientific uh, op uh, opinions as an option, this is not the first option to consider, but when all other avenues are exhausted, yes, this is, this is a way and this is a mechanism which uh, could help. However, I'm, I'm stressing that it should be planned and executed rightly. If we write open letters about uh, any aspect which we can't uh, uh, get done, organized uh, or influenced uh, in any other ways, I guess the world stops listening to us. So we should use this uh, with caution. But as I said, if it's done properly, it's very effective. I would also stress that it requires some dose of good luck, which we uh, had in this case. So this is my answer to your third question. So on behalf of Iziak, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to speak with me today and also congratulate you for this important initiative. Thank you very much for having me. I would like to direct your attention to the Iziak webinar series, Spread of Infectious Diseases in Indoor Environments, where on a weekly basis going back to March, a number of leading scientists have recorded seminars addressing the spread of SARS-CoV-2 indoors. If you are a member of ISEAC, viewing these webinars is free. If you are not a member, the US $135 membership fee entitles you not only to view these webinars, but also to a digital subscription to our journal, Indoor Air. Thank you.